to welcome Dr. Nancy Maya Adams, um, who has a wonderful reputation here at Cal State Long Beach. We hear from the students as well as the professors. And this is a topic that we really wanted to address for a good long time, and so we feel most fortunate that you're here in our community. Um, please join me in welcoming Dr. Nancy Maya Adams. Good morning, and thank you for having me. It's a thrill to be invited. I've heard so much about this group, and, and I know um, you guys are quite a group and do a lot of things in the community. It's great to see so many people here uh, from so many different disciplines. I was asked to come and talk about the impact of school bullying, but I've tried to um, make sure that you have some resources, and I know that you there's not a lot of school people here but I'm thinking that if we talk about bullying and the victims of bullying and even the bystanders, that it will help you all in the different um, arenas where you work with children and with their families. I've tried to provide some resources. Um, I know that when I go to presentations, that's what I like to have is something to take with me. Um, there's a lot of resources on the web. So I did give you a brief resource list, but if you just put in bullying prevention, uh, if you Google that, there are a lot of states that are doing really wonderful things. I gave you some of the main um, federal government and the most well-known ones, but I found a lot of things from different states. So thank you again for inviting me. Uh, I did my dissertation research at the University of Tennessee in Knoxville in the College of Social Work, and I did it on school social work and particularly on bullying, and I looked at uh, how the culture and climate of the school affects the bullies and the victims, or the victims and how that affects the bullies. So um, I haven't done a lot of school social work since I started at Cal State Long Beach because I worked with a wonderful school social worker, Julie O'Donnell, which I know many of you know. Uh, so I, it's really great to be able to come and talk about this research. <clears throat> If you'd like to ask questions during the presentation, you can. I don't want to get too off track. I have some vignettes that I brought with me this morning. I'd like to try to figure out if you can decide whether it's really bullying or aggression. So I want to get to that. Um, but if you do want to stop me on the way, if it, if it seems appropriate, I'll try to answer your questions as we go along. As we all know, bullying has been around forever, right? There's been kids being bullied and picked on and teased. I'm sure that if I, if we had time and I went around the room, we could all remember a time when we were picked on or bullied or saw it happening no matter what age group we were in. But interestingly enough, it was actually the high school shooting in uh, Columbine at Littleton, in Littleton, Colorado on April 20th, 1999 that started people looking at bullying as a problem, as an issue, that these high profile acts of violence could be caused by underlying what we call low level violence. Low level violence in schools is things like bullying, teasing, taunting, things that don't make the headlines, things that we don't read about every day, but we've been finding more and more are leading to or could possibly cause things like um, Eric Harris and uh, Dylan Klebold taking mass weapons to Columbine and killing a total of uh, 23 students, which at the time was the deadliest school shooting in um, American history. Uh, a little bit after that event, there was another shooting. Some people thought that he was because he was uh, maybe copycatting Columbine. What I'd like you to notice, and I just picked a few of the school violence historical points over the last 10, 11 years, is a lot of times they talk about students being mentally ill or the mental illness, which I think really applies to what, you know, what our work, what we do. And is it the fact that they had mental illness problems before, or was it because they were being picked on and bullied that caused their, you know, low self-esteem, depression? That's a big question that people ask. Um, we had a first grade boy in Michigan, Bailey shot a classmate, six years old. After two children had a verbal spat, he took a handgun from his uncle's home where he was living and went to school, shot a little girl. And that was in 2000, 2001. Uh, Charles Andrew Williams was arrested for killing two classmates and wounding 13 other people here in Santee, California. 
And then, of course, April 16, 2007, the Virginia Tech shooting. And again, we know that if you re remember that incident, they talked a lot about his mental illness and whether he had been treated for mental illness or he hadn't been treated or he'd been checked in and checked out. Do you all remember that? There was a huge discussion about whether he had received the type of treatment that he needed while other people were, you know, calling him all kinds of words. <laughs> and then recently, very recently, uh, there were two incidences in Massachusetts that have been on the news a lot. In fact, they've been coming back around the Phoebe Prince um, story has made it back into the news for that very reason. They've asked to see her medical records. Everybody remember who B.B. Prince was? Young girl that hung herself, hanged herself uh, earlier this year, and it was because she had been, where they reported that she'd been bullied, and they actually arrested, I believe it was nine people that they thought were involved with that. Well, now that it's in trial, they're actually calling for her medical records. Has anybody seen that? And they're actually saying now maybe it wasn't from her being bullied, but it was because of her mental health issues, because she was mentally ill before, because she was depressed. And she was depressed because they're trying to say it had nothing to do with the kids picking on her. I don't know how you all feel about that, but a uh, very interesting line of defense. And then there were two incidents in Deerfield Beach, Florida. I only put the one up here because the other one now is being discussed as to whether it was bullying or whether it was because they were arguing over a stolen bike and a stolen video game. Um, but there were two. The one I have up here, uh, Josie Bratley, was the young lady who was beaten severely by the young man who went home and put, home, put on steel-toed boots and went to the school that he did not attend purposely to beat her and kick her and put her into a coma because of a texting issue. So that's the cyberbullying, which we'll talk about later. Does everybody remember that story? It happened not too long ago. So they were texting back and forth and something was said over, over the text that the young man didn't like. It was about she was friends with his girlfriend and they were texting back and forth. And whatever it was that she texted him, he went home, put on steel toed boots, went to the school, actually didn't have any idea what she looked like, asked another girl, asked other students, do you know who this is? They pointed her out and he went to the bus stop and she, um, she is out of the coma now, but she had like two or three brain surgeries because of that beating. So some horrific things, some high, profile violence, but it, what it's done is bring bullying into the forefront. So now there are. You can put in bullying prevention into Google and you can find all kinds of bullying prevention websites. There's been a lot of grants, a lot of federal money. SAMHSA has a wonderful website, but it's all been because people are starting to realize that these events don't just occur out of the blue, that there probably was something going on before these things happened. So, um, a single student of bullies has a wide-ranging impact on the students of, and of, all, of the entire school. Again, my research has basically been about the culture and climate of schools and how that culture and climate can either prevent bullying or, some would say, promote bullying or encourage it or allow it to happen. So stu students deserve to feel safe at school. And when they experience bullying, they, have, they can have these types of, uh, can have these types of effects. Depression, low self-esteem, health problems, poor grades, suicidal thoughts, just not wanting to go to school. Those of you that work with kids might know that there's, you know, a lot of times kids just say they don't want to go to school and you're not sure why and they don't want to talk about it. Um, a lot of times it's because they are being bullied. Students who bully others, uh, when they intentionally bully others, um, our account should be held accountable for their actions. And again, a lot of times, we, I have some myths of bullying here that we're going to go over in just a little bit, but you know, a lot of times people are still saying, oh, kids will be kids. Oh, they'll grow out of it. Oh, it really wasn't that bad. Or, oh, are you sure that that's what happened? I mean, have any of you heard things like that? Um, there's also times when I, I used to work um, for uh, Pasadena Unified School District, and I think some places, uh, the school playground, you hear things worse than, I used to also be a bartender, I used to hear worse things on the playground in Pasadena than I heard at the bar 15, 20 years ago. So you have to really 
be aware of it, and sometimes that may be your hardest job, especially if you're not someone in the school, working in the school, but you're working with the families or you're working with the kids, is trying to get the adults to understand that this is not just kids will be kids, or oh, you know, they'll grow out of it, oh, it's not that bad. Um, those who bully their peers are more likely than those students who do not bully to get into frequent fights, to steal and vandalize property, drink, alcohol, smoke, so have more behavior problems. They have poor grades. They perceive a negative climate at school. So again, talking about the climate of the school, it's not just the victims who may, may perceive a negative climate, like I don't want to go to school, no one will protect me, no one cares. But sometimes the bullies think, there's nobody here that cares about me, there's no reason to go to school, there's no reason to, to show up, nobody's going to pay any attention. So they also perceive a negative climate at the school and at times will carry weapons. Now, there's the third group. There's the observers. There's the bystanders. Again, you may be able to recall a time when you were in school that you, had, you were a bystander or you were being picked on and no one was doing anything. Students who see bullying happen also may feel that they're in an unsafe environment. So they also could feel like the climate of the school is negative because they're not sure who to go and tell. They're not sure what to do. They might want to intervene, but they just don't know if they can. They're afraid of retaliation. If they intervene here when they're, you know, next week, is the bully going to come after them? So they have that fear. So again, Without the adults and the people that they feel like they can go to where they could report it, they a lot of times don't react, but they also suffer emotional problems and psychological problems and may want to just avoid going to school too. It depends on how bad it is. If it happens in the same place at the same time every day, they might just want to avoid that complete area or just not go to school. <clears throat> they sometimes feel fearless, powerless to act, they also sometimes feel very guilty for not acting. They feel like they should do something, but they're not sure what to do. They, at times, can be tempted to participate. It depends on the kids, right? But it's that kind of gang mentality. If everybody's doing it, well, I'll just join in instead of trying to stand up for them. Or again, being afraid that they're going to be picked on or not being seen as being part of the cool kids if they don't. So schools with bullying issues, when bullying continues and school does not take action, again, the entire climate can be affected. And everyone at the school can, you know, it can affect the adults that are involved with the kids too. If they don't feel like that, if you're a teacher or a counselor or a school social worker, um, if you don't feel like you can go to the principal or the administration and report it, or if you feel like you can report it but nothing's going to happen, you're going to feel like, well, why, what are you to try? Right? What, what's the purpose of this? And so there's a, a negative climate and environment um, builds and it builds a, an environment of fear and disrespect. Students then have difficulty learning in this type of environment. Um, students feel insecure. They dislike school. And they perceive that the teachers and adults just don't really care about them. If they don't feel like they can go and get any help from the adults, they perceive that no one really cares about them. Any questions about the impact between the victims and the bystanders and the bullies themselves? Okay, I put some definitions in here. Bullying can be defined in many different ways. And if, again, if you go do the research of this presentation, I found lots and lots of different definitions. But I pulled together this one that I thought really fit the combination. So bullying is repeated harassment, abuse, oppression, or intimidation of another individual, either physical or psychological. It can take the form of teasing, threatening, taunting, or rejecting, like socially isolating someone. That's one that's not always recognized. Uh, hitting, stealing, and just pretty much picking on people. We wanted to say that. Now, interestingly enough, yesterday on the Today Show, I was getting ready for work, and heard that the first ever federal summit on bullying is being held yesterday and today in the Department of Education on Capitol Hill. And it is in response to, or they are saying it's in response to the Phoebe Prince case and the other young man who hanged himself in Massachusetts. That was the 
those were the two events that caused them to decide they needed to have a, a national summit on bullying. So that started yesterday. So last night I pulled a quote off from Kevin Jennings, who is the Deputy Sur Secretary of the Office of Safe and Drug Free Schools. And he said this at the um, summit yesterday. The key thing that defines bullying versus teasing is that bullying has an impact on the student's ability to achieve and to want to be at school. So again, as practitioners and people who work with the children, that is what should be the most important to us, I think. Teasing sometimes is unpleasant, but if it escalates to the point where you actually see students do worse in school, or actually avoid areas in school, or avoid coming to school, then it goes from teasing to bullying. So once it becomes something that's so serious that the kids are having problems getting to school or doing well in school, it, be, it becomes bullying. And that's really where we can start to get the adults involved, right? Because what's the most important thing in, to the administration of the schools these days? Anybody know? Attending school. Having the kids in the seats in the classroom. So if that's what you have to do to approach it, why is that so important to the administrators? That's the money. That's the money. So if that's, if that's how you can get in, then that's the way to get in. If you're having trouble getting a child to go to school, whether, no matter where you're working with that child, you might try to find out if that child is fearful of the school, is fearful of going, is fearful of a person, and maybe you can start to work with the school to start some kind of bullying prevention, or at least alert the adults so they can start to open up a dialogue. Susan. I just had a thought about that definition. Mm -hmm. The thing I don't like about it is if your kid is resilient, and they don't, and they're bullied, but they don't do bad in school, then they're not considered bullied. So it's all about the behavior, not right. just the intent. I, I know I agree. I mean, they really need to be, but I'm not going to work in school, and so my bullying will go unchallenged. It could go unchallenged, yes. I think I think that's a very good point, and I but I think what they're trying to say here, I thought about that a lot too, is that we have to start somewhere. So if you start to get people out of that attitude, the kids will be kids, or oh, it's just teasing. Hopefully, you would start to change the climate of the school, if you can, or the setting, wherever it is. This could be for residential homes, group homes, places you know where people get bullied. It could be in the workplace too. Um, but if you can start to change that climate, even the resilient kids will start to benefit from that. Or, you know, if you feel like you, you know, I don't know how many of you worked in a place where you didn't feel like you could go and talk to someone if you were being bullied at work. But if you feel like you can go and talk to someone and that person will at least listen, even if things won't change right away, if they'll listen to you and you know who you can go to, it makes you feel better about going to work, right? It makes you feel at least somebody cares. So I think you're right. They're trying to make a definition here so you know that it's not everything is bullying necessarily, but if it starts to become where it's affecting the person's performance, it really should be looked at more seriously than teasing. Um, other definitions, the victim is someone who repeatedly is exposed to aggression from peers in the form of physical attacks, verbal assaults, or psychological abuse. And as we know from working in the domestic violence era, you know, arena, um, the psychological is sometimes the hardest to prove, right? There's no signs of it, you don't see the kids fighting, you don't, but, but someone is psychologically abusing other kids, it's bullying. Um, victims are more likely to be boys and to be physically weaker than peers, but girls do bully. Girls do bully. Um, they generally do not have many, if any, good friends, and they may display poor social skills and academic difficulties in school. But other research says that bullies are not always the loner, that sometimes bullies have a group of friends that follow them around because they feel like they're protected because they're they're hanging with the guy who's controlling the playground or the cafeteria. So there's a, there's a difference of opinion in that. And then bystanders generally involved in some capacity, if only as an observer. So it's people that are just standing around and watching, but they're not doing anything about it would be defined as bystanders. They do, some do feel empathy, but they seldom step forward. So again, they feel powerless to defend or support the target. That goes back to the climate of the school. 
If you don't have anybody you can talk to, you know this is going on, but there's no one to help, then you're just going to stand there and watch so you can feel powerless. Um, you're, not reporting, you're not reporting it. Sometimes you join in just so you're not just standing there. Again, it, has, it definitely has to do with the child's personality. You know, some kids would never join in. Some kids would, might just, you know, watch and walk away. You, begin, you may begin to think if there's a lot of it going on and people are just standing by and watching it, then you may begin to think that bullying is the norm here. That's just what goes on. It's just going to happen. It's, just, we just have, it's like kids will be kids. Well, the kids start to think, well, this is just going to happen. We just have to figure out how to either avoid it or live with it. Um, they feel, may feel guilty for not acting, and they can, they can successfully intervene if they feel they're going to have the support and they know how to do that. So again, I, I gave you one of the um, um, tip sheets from Stop Bullying Now, which is about prevention and intervention. So hopefully that will help. And again, that website has a lot of different, um, a lot of different resources for adults, for teachers, for students, for kids, kids helping other kids. So hopefully you'll, if you're needing more tips, you can check that out. Okay, now this one I know that there's a, there's one in here that I know Susan's gonna get to me on because it's about conflict resolution. But one more <laughs> one more um, definition: bullying is best understood as a subgroup of aggressive behavior. Hence, any aggressive responses can be classified as bullying. As bullying, sorry, if the following important features are there. So let's look at those, and then we're gonna look at some vignettes. There's an imbalance of power between the perpetrator and the victim. So if they're, if they're on the same level and they're fighting, it's a fight, it's conflict. If, it's, if there's an imbalance in the power, then it's bullying. The reoccurrence of aggressive behavior over time. So again, one time event, two kids, maybe even if there is an imbalance of power, it happens one time, it doesn't happen again, it was a fight. But if it happens over and over again, it's defined as bullying. And always, Dan Always, who's been, who's one of the premier bullying researchers in the world, he's done all his research in Norway, and actually was doing a lot of research on bullying way before Columbine, but it was all done in Norway, nothing in the United States, refers to bully victim relationships as abusive, indicating little or no mutuality. Uh, the feature distinguishes bullying from the term conflict. So if you would, and we're going to stop right there. Are there any questions? Yes. A lot of the descriptions you're using seem to be more physical, where the person, the two people, or the bystanders, victim, perpetrator, there. Doesn't seem to characterize the bullying that occurs over the internet through text messaging, because there may, they may, may not be any physical manifestations at school in terms of aggression right. or comments. So how do the bystanders and the bullies, it might be more than one because they pass on the message, the picture, the image, the comment. Mm -hmm. Well, we actually I have some definitions on cyberbullying, and there's actually a vignette that's going to address that. It's a very good point, though. Again, these are kind of the general terms, and that some of it has had to be adapted to cyberbullying. I think if you if you think about cyberbullying, I mean, from what we hear a lot about for kids, it's usually kids who know other kids or know of them. Maybe that's not necessarily true. There can be just strangers cyberbullying, but it, there probably would be that same issue of the power imbalance because if you feel, if you're being bullied on the internet, if someone's picking on you on the internet and you feel strong enough to resist it, you would probably just, it would just stop, right? I mean, it's the same kind of, if you, kind of like what Susan was saying about resilience. If, if you're not, if you feel like someone's sending you insulting messages and you are pretty, you have high self-esteem and you know that this is wrong, you probably just wouldn't engage in it, hopefully, right? But then if it's, uh, if you have a relationship with this person and you're going to see this, you know, some of the, the stories like the Phoebe Prince and there was another one, do you remember the story about the, um, 
the young lady who I think killed herself, and her, the mother, and it was the mother doing the cyber bullying and pretending to be a boy that she liked. I mean, so, I mean, stuff like that. They all lived in the same neighborhood. They lived down the street. So when, so there was a, definitely a power differential, even if it had been a boy and not the mother, because they had facts about her, so they kept throwing the facts in, and she kept trying to respond to it. So, but a very good point. The cyberbullying has started a whole new issue around bullying, and I think it, it plays into the reason they're having the summit in uh, D.C. yesterday and today, because it's, it's growing so fast and so much where you can't, I mean, you can't just address it at school because you don't know what's going on at home. Um, they're, they're, the theory is, though, that if there's a good school climate or the kids are going somewhere where it's not acceptable, if bullying in general is not acceptable, and you have ways and people to talk to, that hopefully that will go through to the kids who are being cyberbullied, too, that they can go and tell their parents. Uh, but there are definitely on that uh, Stop Bullying Now, there are tips for parents to help stop cyberbullying, too. But thank you. That's a very good question. Um, you have, yes. That's okay. Um, we're working in a high school. Um, it always amazes me the number of students who will get into I'm not a school. And so when you look at the observers, there are so many of them. And I'm hoping you're going to address how do you get that concept? I'm not going to be a school. Across the board, it's like every kid in class is going, I'm not telling, I'm not, I'm not right. a school. It's like, I don't want to live in that world. Right. Yeah. No, and that's, it's a very good question. I mean, that is, I mean, right, that's the reason bullying is happening, because people don't want to tell, either the victim doesn't want to tell, and the bystanders, who do they tell, and is it going to be accepted, and are they going to be picked on more? So they just see themselves, oh, I don't want to be a tattler or a squealer, and even in high school. By the way, do you know which level of school bullying happens the most, whether it's elementary, middle, or high school? What age group? Middle. 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 Definitely middle. Um, but it still goes on high school and definitely goes on in elementary school. I mean, and one of the stories there was a six-year-old who took a gun to school. But um, it's a very good question, Mary, and, and it, I have, there's some tips here, but again, it, the, the main research behind this is still about the culture and climate. So if you can change the culture, like if the adults in the school promote anti-bullying campaigns and there's a way to tell what like it's an anonymous suggestion box or what you know it, but it has to really start at the top because the kids aren't going to start it they are too afraid of squealing or too afraid of being picked on or retaliation so if, there, if it's a negative kind of if you go and try to report it and somebody just says oh are you just imagining that or really did that happen or you know then why would you why would you go and report it You'll just kind of try to stay back and stay out of the way. A lot, a lot of kids do. Um, any other questions? Okay, you have a series of, um, I think there's six vignettes on a, a piece of paper. One of the five. And if you would just maybe like pair up or groups of four with people right around you. And um, I think. They're pretty short. I don't know if we should maybe divide divide up and not try to conquer all of them. I don't know. Do you all want to try to conquer all of them? Or should we break it up? Okay. So how about the, this group do, the front part of this group do um, number one, and the back part of this table do number two. Um, this is a pretty blender. This part do number three. This part of the table do number four. Um, the front half of the table do number five. And if you would do number one again. Okay? It's just a sheet of paper with the five. Any, does everybody, anybody else? So you're, you're your task is to read the vignette and see if you think it's bullying or aggression. Number one, yeah. For this front of the part of the table. So I'll give you about five minutes to discuss. Everybody else have a copy close by them?
he'd been bullied before, and this was um, retaliation. There were no impacts on top of that in terms of the uh, person who was then with the slitted jacket. Okay. But it was a single act. It didn't seem to be Okay. The uh, researcher here says that it is aggression, it's indirect, covert, and distracted, but he definitely felt like he was being bullied, so it was a retaliation type of, of uh, act back. So it would be considered bullying. Okay, good. Number four. It's right here. What did you decide? Thank you. All right, we decided it was bullying. Okay. And it's actually personality. Okay, this one is a clear bullying one, and the main, there's, it is, great job, it's the imbalance of power between Christine on the one hand and Lisa and their friends on the other, as well as the reoccurrence of this behavior over time. It classifies it as bullying. So just that. And number five was, down here, did two different groups do number five? Again, this is like the cyberbullying. This is another thing that a lot of people don't necessarily see every day in the school. They don't pay attention to it, right? We all know working with kids, and I think everybody in here has worked in some capacity with children, it's the ones that are quiet and stay sitting in their chairs and do their work are, you know, what we leave those alone because we're spending so much time working on the kids that are the aggressors, that are the ones causing the trouble, that are up out of their seats. So a lot of times the kids being socially excluded, you might not even notice it. Um, and that's really important. Those are things where people have to watch out for kids that are on the playground and never playing with groups of kids. They're in the cafeteria by themselves. They'd rather stay in the library sometimes than go out to play, things like that. So she um, she's being socially excluded from her natural group through the use of several overt and covert indirect aggressive acts. She's not considered worthy of being a friend, and she's been excluded for some time. Not only is she openly rejected in the schoolyard, she's also treated poorly in the classroom. And in addition, the social exclusion extends outside the school context through lacking invitation to the party. And from the victim's perspective, she is definitely being bullied, and from everyone else that would look at this, she's definitely being bullied. So you did a good job. Thank you. Give yourselves a hand. So that's just a, you know, again, if you if you need to be able to try to show someone that it is bullying versus aggression or bullying versus conflict, you might, there are some um, tools that you could use. All right, so now we'll move into the cyberbullying definitions. Um, cyberbullying is sometimes referred to as online social cruelty or electronic bullying. Uh, it's an aggressive, intentional act carried out by a group or individual using electronic forms of contact Again, repeatedly over time against a victim who cannot easily defend himself or herself. So you see how that, you know, obviously if you're sitting somewhere and you don't even know who it is that's picking on you, you definitely have trouble defending yourself. It can involve sending mean and vulgar or threatening messages or images, posting sensitive private information and lies about another person, pretending to be someone else, we talked about that already, um, and intentionally excluding someone from an online group. Again, the social exclusion can happen online and it's considered cyberbullying. So someone who can't, is not allowed into a social group and cut out of, you know, nowadays you can defriend someone on Facebook like that. And that's actually social exclusion. So, and it can be devastating again to kids in middle school if they just all of a sudden are defriended by people. Um, children and youth can cyberbully each other through emails, and messaging, text, social networking, blogs, and I put a little cartoon up there. I thought that was, by banning YouTube in schools, we hope to stop bullying in cyberspace and get it back on the playground where it belongs. <laughs> <laughs> <Scary>. <laughs> 
sorry. Um, okay. These are some of the statistics that they um, framed this around the victim today, but thank you for asking that. If you're working with kids who are bullies, you might want to talk to them more about some of the things they, you know, what's going on with them. Again, some people would say, oh, it's the mental illness, right? A lot of the times the people that were bullied, again, this young man um, in, for the, in the Virginia Tech shooting had been bullied and had gone to a mental health clinic and had been like, I think he'd actually been checked into the hospital, if I remember correctly, and was released within 24 hours. And his only, the only way he thought he could retaliate was to take a gun to school and kill the people who had been picking on him. So a lot of times that is, and again, we see that in workplace violence too, right? A lot of times the person who feels like they've been picked on or, you know, have been, a victim then becomes the aggressor. The difference is that in the workplace, the employer is responsible for the safety of all the employees. It doesn't happen in schools. Right. And I just wondered, because um, you're focusing on the school climate as opposed to other uh, influences, in the school where there are, because a lot of schools have no bullying pledges. I mean, there are programs and then there are programs. So is there evidence to show that, like, the safety programs that have been more effective, or is it more the attitude of the leadership of the school? You know what I'm saying? Mm -hmm. yeah. No, I do. And there are some programs that the, um, the safe, the, the, there's the Center for the Study of Violence and Bullying, I think it's on the resource there, and, and things that Dan Olweiss has been doing for a long time, and people that have adopted his bullying prevention program. But there's a lot of programs that have some research behind it. Sometimes what I've seen, though, and the things that I've witnessed and researched is that if you can't get the buy-in of the entire school, even if the program has been seen to be effective, it's like it's like anything we do, right? They come up with a great program, and if you could replicate that program the way it was done the first time, it probably will work. But if you take it somewhere and you water it down, then it's not going to be the same effective program. So you're right, but even in the workplace, I mean, in the workplace, you can... You can sue somebody for not doing it. In the school, you really can't. There, but there are effective programs, and the main, the main research, and Ron Astor, who is a faculty at USC, who's done a lot of research on school violence, um, and a lot of, a lot of research um, in school violence and violence in Israel with school kids, it's all about the climate. His, his, um, his way of dealing with it first is kind of what Tori was saying, is you map out the school. You have to go in and map out the school. And then you have to get the buy-in to change the culture and climate of anything. I mean, that's organizational culture and climate research is you've got to get the buy-in from everybody. And most of the time, the schools don't have the staff, the personnel, the time uh, to do enough training. You can't just do one, okay, it's bullying prevention week, everybody pay attention, and this is what we're going to do from it. And because, you know, everybody's overworked and underpaid, and all the school social workers are being let go. So to keep, to sustain it, to just say it and put the posters up, won't do it. It's not going to change the climate. And that's where if you can get the buy a lot of people do, a lot of schools have taken on, like, peer mediation and peer groups that go around and help police. I mean, you have, you, they, the adults have to realize that you need help. You can't do it by yourself, and that you have to include everyone. Um, but good questions. Um, let me get through the myths here real quick. The children and youth who are bullied will always tell an adult. Now I don't know, but it, does anybody in this room really believe that? I don't even think we think that's a myth, right? But that's one of the ten myths, and I suppose it's important for us to know if the clients we're working with think that, that oh, if he's really good, she's really getting picked on, she will tell somebody, because that is not true. And that may be one of the problems why it's allowed to go on in certain places. Children and youth who bully are mostly loners with few social skills. So these are all coming from Stop Bullying Now, which is the government website that I, I gave you a couple other handouts from them. They have lots and lots of tips. They have lots of videos, little video cartoon clips that you can show little kids and clips for older kids. But children who bully usually do not lack friends, which was opposite of what we saw earlier. Well, this, this website and this research is saying they do have people that hang out with them. In fact, some research finds that they have larger friendship networks than other children. Importantly, they usually have at least a small group of friends who will support and encourage them. And again, that may just be there, the other kids wanting to fit in. 
and they generally have more leadership skills. It's not easy to be a bully, right? You have to you have to be able to plan. You have to be able to know what's going on. So while they may be doing very poorly in school, it doesn't mean they're lacking leadership skills or ways to think about how they're going to do their next act of bullying. And what happens when kids usually act up? Do you know what happens to them at school? Where do they usually get sent? To the detention room. Do you know who they're in there with? All the other kids that are acting up. So they can sit and plot their next step. Uh, taking them out of the classroom and putting them in a room, in a detention room with a lot of other kids who are all in there for the same reason. It's kind of like sending them to jail, right? Would you say they really have friendships? Or are these people who are afraid to be victims of the bullying themselves? So they copy and mimic and follow the directions of the, the leaders. So well, I think it could be both. I mean, as we saw in the, the bystander point before, is that sometimes bystanders just join the group and stay with that group of friends or, or connect themselves with that because they'd rather be in that group than be the ones being picked on. But they're actually saying, this is the first time I've actually seen this myth being posted that they say they actually have friends too. Um, I, there's a lot more research to say that bullies usually are loners or, you know, the outcast or something. I mean, they're bullying because they want the attention. Um, so I'm not really sure. This one was surprising to me that they had friends. I'm challenging with the use of the word friends. Is right. it really friends as you find friends or people that pretend to be acquaintances friends, or, yeah. But they fall in that special group because...